Creative Library. I'm Lynn Montague, Head of Youth Services, and I'm here today doing a special author visit interview with Tanuja Desai Idie. And we are really excited to have her here with us. She's written some fantastic young adult novels, and she's done book tracks to go with them. Got uh, some great questions to go over with with Tanuja, and I'm just so excited and so pleased to have you here with us. And I'm <laughs> so excited to be here also. It's my first visit to Sun Prairie, and um, it's been an amazing introduction. So thank you for you know making time to have this conversation. Absolutely. I couldn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, your first book, which I'm going to actually hold up your books, because this is her first edition, and this is the the new and improved cover, second yes, edition. Yes, a bit shinier. Um, <laughs> Born Confused was Tanuja's first book. Um, it came out quite a while ago, actually. I read it when I was quite a bit younger. <laughs> it was the first ever, I believe, the first ever South Asian American coming of age teen novel, I believe. Yes. Um, did you realize this when you were writing it? I had no idea when I was writing it. I think, um, for me, I, I think one of the reasons I wrote the book, though, was to fill a hole that had been on my childhood bookshelf when I was growing up. Um, but I don't think I really thought of it in those terms. You know, I didn't know if there were other books like that out there by that point or not. I just knew that when I had grown up, um, my, my parents were the first on both sides of the family to immigrate to the USA from India. And in Wilbraham, Massachusetts, which is, which is where I grew up in um, Western Massachusetts, we were the first South Asian family in that whole area. We had no kind of relatives anywhere nearby at that point. And as well, um, there were no South Asians or people of this cultural background reflected in the culture at large. So you didn't kind of have South Asian faces on the pages of magazines or on TV or on movie screens and advertisements, any of these things, and certainly not in, um, in books that were available mm -hmm. then. And I don't know if I really noticed it in those kind of conscious terms at that point. Um, but I think later during my years in New York, I started to wonder what it might have been like to have, you know, people who, even on a superficial level, looked more like the people in my family or myself, et cetera, um, available in, in literature and music and all these other sort of art forms. So I think it was kind of my way of addressing um, something that I'd been missing as a child, though I, I didn't realize I was missing it at the time. Right. Yeah. That ties right into uh, the, the We Need Diverse Books movement. Yes. That's, which I believe you've been involved in as well. Yeah, and yeah. We need, kids need to be able to see themselves in the pages of books. Absolutely. It's so important. <laughs> I think it's very important. It's very, it's very empowering, and it also makes you feel um, valued by mm -hmm. the environment that you're in and the culture that you're in as well. And it's just been really exciting because when Born Confused um, first came out, it, it was considered to be the first South Asian American coming of age story. Um, and in the years that have passed since, and you know, it's been re-released in 2014, mm -hmm. but quite a few years passed, you know, between 2002 and, and 2014. <laughs> um, and we've seen more and more um, voices from all kinds of backgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, being expressed and kind of having their own voices heard and their own stories told. And I think this is really exciting because only when we have a full chorus of voices are we able to approximate something even resembling a truth about human experience. Absolutely. So that's been wonderful to see. And uh, yeah, we need diverse books and diverse readers and um, just is, even if, if it's sort of, um, it's a mindset as well, I think, more than just being about where you're from or what racial background you have. It's kind of, for me, um, diversity is also just uh, having a mind that's open to new ideas and to possibility and exploring other ways of being and seeing. Absolutely. Mm. That's, I think Dimple's experience, you know, reading at, about it from someone whose experience is so different from Dimple's, but yet, I feel like so much of her life relates back to mine, even though we are of completely different backgrounds, which yeah. is so amazing. Um, Very happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's <just laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I think it's partly also I, something kind of ironic that I found is that the more detailed I think you are about your experience or the experience you're trying to convey mm -hmm. in a story, um, ironically, the more universal sometimes it ends up being. And I guess it's because really once you kind of get under those details, you know, we're all human together and we're all on this journey together and most of kind of the, the big events in life or the big emotions or those sorts of experiences are quite similar. Absolutely. So it feels really nice to know that, you know, we've had this connection, you growing up in Wisconsin, me over there in Western Massachusetts and now in the UK, but there's a real, there's a real bond, I think. Absolutely. That we all have and then, you know, we kind of discover through the magic of books. That we are all the same inside. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and Tunisia's 
sequel, <laughs> in <laughs> essence, to Born Confused, Bombay Blues, came out this last year in 2014. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's been over a decade between the release of Born Confused and Bombay Blues. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> how long did it take you to write Born Confused, and how does it compare to the writing of Bombay Blues? Why there, was there such a long time Yes. Period? Well, I will first say that 10 years have gone by between books. I have a 10-year-old daughter, <laughs> 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 and I have a 6-year-old daughter. So that's you know one of the reasons mm -hmm. um, is Parents that, do that. <laughs> yes, motherhood happened in between books. Um, writing these books, they were completely different experiences. So Born Confused um, was written before I had kids. And in Born Confused, I drew a lot on my years in New York City. I had just moved to London by the time I wrote it, but the whole book is set in New York, where I had lived for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And although the plot line is fictitious, the club scene, the party scene, the things that were happening within the culture and the city itself, those are all drawn from, you know, from fact, from things that I'd experienced. So with Born Confused, it didn't really require um, any research because I had, you know, walked down those streets and I'd kind of like, you know, been in a lot of those places and I, I really knew that that city sort of like the back of my hand, better so, than the back so of my Dimple hand. So Dimple Lala, the protagonist, it really, really does have an autobiographical element. Yeah, again, I think not the plot line so much, but mm -hmm. the cityscape and I think all the emotions that she's felt in both books are all emotions that I've felt. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't feel them before she did, I definitely did while <laughs> she was feeling them. Um, so yeah, that in that sense, definitely autobiographical. And the issues are like the sort of, you know, not feeling Indian enough or American enough and not knowing how to bring these two sides of the hyphen together. I think those were things that I was dealing with in, in other ways. Okay. Um, but the first uh, book, it took nine months. It took four months to uh, write the first draft and five months to revise it. I mean, it was kind of around the clock, but a relatively short amount of time. So it seems like a very quick writing. <laughs> yes, but Bombay Blues took, um, it took more than three years. Okay. Um, I was writing an album of songs based on it at the same time that I was writing the novel, and it took more than three years to complete both the book and the album, and they were finished within days of each other. But that whole experience, part of it was having children, but also um, I didn't know Bombay. I had lived there a couple of years as a baby. So whereas with Born Confused, I was, I was drawing from kind of a lived history. Mm -hmm. With Bombay Blues, I was going to Bombay and thinking about Bombay, but really going there in search of the story that I was trying to tell. And I knew I wanted to forge uh, my own connection with this city because it's a literal motherland. My mother was born there. My brother was born there. My parents met there. They married there. So it's a city that um, means a lot in family history. And I felt like I wanted to know more about this place that means so much to people who mean so much to me. And then also kind of see if there was a way I could connect with it in my own kind of you know life today. Right. So. So yeah, really a bit longer. <laughs> did a, a much well, there it seems like there was a lot more research that had to go into oh. to Bombay Blues than Born Confused. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, so much research. Yeah. Because although my character doesn't need to know everything about Bombay when she gets mm -hmm. there, because you know she's not from there and she's exploring it in depth for the first time, I still felt like I always needed to know more than the character. Mm -hmm. And you know, in some cases, I paired information away from her point of view okay. so that it would fit the character. But I felt like I needed to know more. Um, just out of respect for the city, I think, because I felt a bit, you know, I felt like I was kind of being granted this great opportunity to get intimate with this city and a place that wasn't, you know, really home for me, um, except in kind of a theoretical or emotional sense. Take and full so advantage of that opportunity. Yes, yeah. and, and take a lot of care with it. Absolutely. So. That took a while. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, so Bombay Spleen is a book track that you wrote to go with Bombay Blues. Yes. And, and there's also, When We Were Twins goes with Born Confused. Yes. I've never heard of another author doing book tracks to go yeah. with their books. Yeah. <laughs> how did you think of this idea, or how did it come to you? And can, tell Gosh. me more about the evolution of, of the book, book track. tracks. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I think books and music have always been a part of my life and have been something that I've loved since I was a little kid. So when I was growing up, I always had my you know, nose in a book. We didn't have Kindle then, or it would have been kind of odd to <laughs> <laughs> put your nose against a Kindle. But, um, you know, I was literally glued to books. I would read at the dinner table. I would read in the bathtub. My childhood favorites all have warped, yellowed pages <laughs> from bathwater hitting yes. them. Um, and I love music. And there's always kind of music in the house. My brother played piano. I briefly played piano. My uh, mother is always singing. My father is humming along and all. And um, so those were two great loves. And 
I think I kind of always saw them as part of the same art form, which is writing. Mm -hmm. So I wrote short stories when I was um, growing up. I also wrote poetry, but sometimes I could hear the melody of the poems, and they would turn into into songs. Okay. Uh, not sort of full-fledged recorded songs, yeah. but you know, words and melody together. And then later, um, I was in bands. So in New York, I um, was the lead singer in a punk pop band called IO, and before that, a recording project where nobody, not many people heard the recordings, <laughs> <laughs> but there were three of us doing this project called Wild Mercury. And when I moved to London, I was in a band called um, San Francisco for a while. And I was in San Francisco while I was writing Born Confused. Okay. So, you know, although I didn't write the songs uh, based on Born Confused until after that book was done, music was part of my life already because I was, you know, playing music with this group of people. And we weren't doing that many gigs when I was in the heart of the writing process, but we were before and then after. Okay. And so that album um, we completed, it, it was written with um, the band in London and also the um, kind of lead guitarist from the band I'd been in in New York, Adam Fellows. And um, that was done two years after the book came out. And then with Bombay Blues, uh, everything came out basically at the same time. And I wrote half of that album with the guitarist from the London band and the other half again with Adam okay. <laughs> and uh, Dave Sherma produced it. So it was when, when We Were Twins came out, Wired magazine did a feature on it as being the first ever book track, which was kind of neat. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's not something I had ever heard of yeah. you know, before When We Were Twins. Uh, just, yeah, I guess, again, I didn't really think about it that much, but it just felt like a natural way to explore the story just from the sonic angle yeah. in one case and, you know, from kind of the prose angle. I mean, to me, books and music really do go together. So yeah, it absolutely. Makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's fascinating. Have you heard of any authors doing it since then? I, I've never heard mm. of anyone else doing anything like it. No, so. I guess I'm not. Yeah, it's no. really unique. I know a couple, I've met a couple of authors who do music as well, but not, um, I don't, like they haven't done the, yeah, the book track idea. But it also fit because um, both books have music as a theme right. and there are a lot of characters who actually do music so mm. there are DJs and there's musicians there's um, music venues yep. and um, in Bombay Blues particularly because I was writing the songs at the same time mm -hmm. there are actually you know lyrics from the album that are embedded in the book and vice versa yeah. so there's a lot of cross feed it's very cool <laughs> <laughs> so a slightly different direction um, yeah. Can you speak, you know, Born Confused, not everyone might know where that title comes from, the, the ABCD yes. aspect of Born Confused. I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, and reading Born Confused was my first exposure to even hearing that term. Yeah. Um, can you tell our viewers more about that term and kind of yes. what the power of, like, the, the acronyms and the, that sort of labeling, how, what's the power behind it? Absolutely. I mean, actually, I have to say, I didn't, I had never heard of this term either okay. until I got to college. <laughs> So we were, had similar experiences in that way too. Um, so ABCD, it's the title Born Confused comes from this term ABCD, which stands for American Born Confused They See. And They See means a person of South Asian origin or has roots in South Asia, uh, meaning India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Um, those are, you know, there's seven core countries in South okay. Asia. And um, the first time I heard this term was when I got to college, because when I, I grew up there, Outside of my home, there weren't that many South Asians around, and certainly not South Asians from South Asia. Right. You know, they were kind of American. Later, when I met them, they were American-born, like mm -hmm. myself. Um, and so, in university, it was the first time I met, you know, uh, people in my peer group who were Indian from India, who had grown up in India, and Pakistani from Pakistan, etc. And I had a group of friends in kind of my last year in university who were a mix of, um, of students from Karachi and Bombay and Delhi, et cetera. And they used to affectionately call me um, their ABCD because I was the only American-born uh, the Desi. Yeah. Um, and then I found out it meant American-born confused Desi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they said it with a lot of affection. So, you know, that was quite nice. Um, but there's, I found out later there's an entire alphabet. And I'm not, sh I'm not sure if they were aware of this, but there's a whole alphabet that goes along really? with this moniker. Yeah, all the way to Z. I didn't write this, although it's included in um, Born Confused. There's two versions, and they're both kind of full of stereotypes. They're a little bit funny. They're a little bit, you know, they can be disturbing as well, depending on what your mood you're in, um, as stereotypes can be. Right. So the first version is American Born Confused Desi, emigrated from Gujarat, house in Jersey, um, keeping lots of motels, named Om Karnath Patel, quickly reaching success through underhanded vicious ways, xenophobic yet zestful. 
And the second version is American Born Confused They See, emigrated from Gujarat, house in Jersey, kids learning medicine, now owning property, quite reasonable salary, two uncles visiting, white xenophobia, yet zestful. So we are clearly very zestful. <laughs> we all live in Jersey. I did have uncles visiting at one point, but I have never met an Om Karnath Patel. So okay. those of you watching <laughs> would Om Karnath Patel please step forward. So yes, yeah, so this, um, this term, when I first heard it, I felt a sense of excitement mm -hmm. that this, you know, what I had considered to be a neither here nor there space, like, you know, Indian American, not quite Indian, not quite American, mm -hmm. that there was a, a, a term for it. It had a name. But of course, I felt a little bit indignant that, you know, it was a name created by people who weren't really a part of this space. And later, through the character of Dimple Lala, I wanted to kind of redefine the C for confused to one for creative, to American born creative, they see, because that seemed to me to more accurately describe the. South Asians that I started to meet in New York, the South Asian Americans, et cetera, who were, you know, shaping, we were kind of shaping and creating the culture as we went along. And I mean, I didn't realize that I was at the time because I was still confused about what I was going to do. Back on it, <laughs> but looking it, back yeah. on it, I can see that, yes, it was this amazing cultural moment that was happening. And, you know, we were really experiencing the r rise of subculture into culture. Mm -hmm. So that term kind of sparked a lot of the writing path. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I know we've talked about um, how living in New York and going to Bombay, how that's influenced your writing. Yes. Um, and that there is some autobiographical elements, you know, certainly not the plot lines, but yes. you know, feelings and emotions. Yes. What else influences your writing? Um, I think everything in, is, in, is a source of inspiration uh, once you're kind of in the zone a little bit. Okay. So um, let me think. I mean, I think mostly it's life. It's kind of the people around me, family history. I mean, for both books, I think a great kind of um, catalyst for me wanting to even explore these stories um, is both of them are a way for me to find a connection to the world that my parents left behind, even though they're set sort of today and they might not be completely about kind mm -hmm. of the family history of the character. So that's, um, that's kind of a great force that's moved me that way. And um, once I, I found kind of once I'm in the writing zone, inspiration appears like from every direction. So um, film um, is very inspiring. Music I always find to be very inspiring. Um, to get in the shoes of the character, I also started to take a lot of photographs okay. because she's a photographer. Yeah. In the first book, not so much, but I was learning about, I was reading about darkroom technique and all and trying to walk around looking at the world through her eyes. And with Bombay Blues, I was actually taking photographs. Of Bombay. The, <laughs> yeah, just, and they were more, um, it was more to have kind of visual reminders and notes. Um, to kind of guide me when I got back to London. But I think this also like kind of inhabiting the shoes of another person and kind of looking at the world through their eyes, I find that to be endlessly inspiring and exciting. And I kind of had to do it with all the characters, but particularly with Dimple. Yeah. But I think um, one thing I've learned about inspiration though is that you can't really wait for it to appear. <laughs> you just have to kind of start doing the work and start having okay. the experience. and. And then it just kind of is constantly there. Then it comes. I think it does. Yeah, it okay. sort of frees. It's freed to, to be. Yeah. So, um, who would you recommend? You, you know, as a librarian, I get asked a lot of time about recommending books. Who would you recommend your books to? Do you have a target yeah. audience in mind when you're writing? No, definitely okay. not. <laughs> um, I mean, in fact, I, you know, never thought about that aspect of either of the books. Born Confused, I sold on a proposal before it was written. <laughs> and I just, I, it's kind of a, a funny story because I actually was at a, a music concert for an artist uh, named Fiona Apple and the violinist in the punk pop band I'd been in had invited a bunch of her friends. And in that group was um, David Levithan, the man <laughs> who had become my editor on both books and you know now a dear friend as well. And um, that night we didn't talk about books at all. We talked about music mainly. Okay. Uh, but then a couple months later, when I knew that we were going to be moving to London, I thought I'd um, try to meet with him at Scholastic and see if I could find some copy editing, freelance work, or editing work, because that's what I had been doing in the last few years in New York, so that I could get to London, you know, and hit the ground running and have, have some kind work. of work. And yeah. yeah, and unbeknownst to me, he was about to launch the Push imprint, and I went in to meet with him at Scholastic a couple weeks before moving, and literally within minutes of my arrival, he said, well, perfect timing, so what's your book idea? <laughs> <laughs> and thank, thankfully, <laughs> I didn't say, oh, well, no, that's, that's not why I'm here, <laughs> you know. Um, and I, I said, and this was the truth, actually, that I had been working on um, these short stories with a South Asian 
American heroine, and I was hoping to connect them and turn it turn them into a novel, which actually is not those short stories aren't what Born Confused <laughs> okay. is, but that was how the process sort of began. And he said, "That's great. Um, we haven't seen a book like that on the bookshelves, and we'd love to help you get it there. So um, send us a synopsis and a kind of outline, you know, when you get there." Yeah. And I did that, and then they bought it, and um, and it was great because I had someone, you know, waiting for the book. So I think. I don't think it's a great idea to think of your audience while you're writing. You have to sort of really stick with your characters because mm -hmm. it's also quite hard to know what your readers are going to be looking for. If you start to think about that, I think you kind of lose track of the story. But I would say that they are books for anyone, really, because they're about culture and multiculturalism, but I think at heart they're about love and friendship and learning to um, be okay in your own skin. Absolutely. So. I mean, there's so many uni universal truths, I feel like, in the books. You know. There's so much about love, the first love, you know? Yeah, yeah. And love as you get older and yeah. the differences and how you have to find yourself. That's what I love. Yes, about I think we never stop coming of age. So yeah. I think that maybe that's why coming of age stories can be so powerful because they would apply at any time. And they really, they speak to everyone. Yes. So mm. now this is a stylistic question. Yes. Because it's one that I've never seen <laughs> before. Okay. And so in your books, when there's uh, dialogue, instead yeah. of using quotation marks, you use a dash to signify dot dialogue. Yeah. Why do you do that? Uh, you know, I'm not sure how it started how did exactly. That come? Yeah. Well, the the Born Confused, I I wrote most of it longhand. Okay. I wow. didn't I didn't, you didn't type it. I wrote long like I'd write longhand um, four to five hours during the day in like different cafes around Portobello mm -hmm. Road where we were living, and then I'd transcribe uh, in the evening, and it was a very mechanical act, but I would kind of edit as I went and like take the story okay. a bit further, um, and it kind of just started as soon as the dialogue started. Um, while I was writing in these notebooks. And I think, though, that I often find quotation marks a little bit jarring, especially the end quotes, because to me, they look like they imply that the entire conversation has happened in the words in between these quotation marks, when so often what is being said is happening outside of Those the words that are actually yes. uttered. And it's happening in just the energy in the room or the body language mm -hmm. or you know, also all the kind of um, subtexts and other layers that people are bringing into a conversation because we always carry our entire story into any interaction we have. Um, so for me, it f it feels more true in a way that there isn't an end quote. And for me, also just visually, I feel like the dash. It creates a kind of more dreamlike atmosphere it does. than the quotes. Absolutely. Yeah, and both yeah. both stories are told quite closely from inside Dimple's head as well. Mm -hmm. So I felt like that um, that sort of fit. The point kind of view. It's more self-talk almost. Yeah. There's what I always read. It, uh, there's quite a bit of self-talk from Dimple. In yeah. The books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, do you have? You know, well, first of all, do you have any advice to give to young writers who are just kind of dipping their feet into the writing pool? Yes, and to any writers, to okay. young writers, old writers, <laughs> writers, writers of any gender, <laughs> anybody who's writing. Um, one big thing that I learned through this whole process of, you know, through Dimple's journey and my own journey that accompanied hers, um, is that you should never underestimate the power of your own story and never feel like you don't have one because everybody has one and it's valuable and needs to be heard and shared and there is an audience. Um, once these tales get told, you sort of, you can create your audience just by sort of speaking and expressing, expressing these things. So I would say that's, that's a huge thing. Um, because writing is ultimately an act of faith. You're kind of trying to create a world, you know, off a blank page and mm -hmm. make it real enough to communicate to, to somebody else. And I think as humans, we're all doing that. We're all kind of trying to communicate as best as we can and take the world that's in here and, and kind of hand it to the people that we care about and, and show ourselves and share ourselves. I think that's a really so. powerful statement that everyone has a story. You know, Absolutely. I think there are, there are especially young people that don't feel like they have a story. Yeah. And to realize, to understand in themselves that I do have a story. Yes. We all have a story. Yes. Everyone has a story. We are walking, breathing, living stories. Stories. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> put pen yeah. to paper and put your story down. Yes. So. <laughs> so you're in town to accept the South Asian Book Award, which is presented by the South Asian National Outreach Consortium. What, what was it like to receive a call that you were winning a national award? <laughs> it's been very, very exciting. Although it's very funny because I, I had actually turned my phone off. We were on a family trip, and I had turned my phone off to be just kind of fully with the family and everything. And I turned it on again after four or five days, 
and I first saw the news on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so I had been tagged in some tweets, and I was like, huh? I was kind of looking, and I didn't understand kind of what had happened. And I actually couldn't access my email from where we were until we got back to London. Um, so I, I gathered the news a bit from these, these tweets, and then I sort of saw the kind of, you know, the full messages, mm -hmm. et cetera, when we got back. And um, it was just very exciting. It just felt... It felt absolutely exhilarating and wonderful because, again, when you're writing, it's this whole process where you have to go so kind of deep into your head. Mm -hmm. You know, I was writing in cafes, so people were there, but a lot of it's quite solitary, although you have the company of your characters. Um, and then kind of when you come out of that space where you've been in there for such a long time, especially this one, which is quite long, you know, more right. than three years, to, to kind of see that, that this story has actually communicated with people you've never met, in a state you've never been in, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm now very happily in. Um, it just felt very moving and very powerful, and I feel really, really lucky that I've gotten to come here and you know meet people like you and and discover this new wonderful you know city of Sun Prairie and Madison, Wisconsin, and um, with the Saba Book Awards and the conference, the 44th annual conference on South Asia, also um, to have the opportunity to be amongst people who have a real love of books mm -hmm. and sharing ideas and talking about cultures and stories and all of these things we've been talking about here as well. So. Yeah, it has been an absolute pleasure being able mm. to chat with you and get to know too. you a little bit, Tanuja. <laughs> We'd like to end our show with um, actually a track from Bombay Spleen. Yeah. And I'd like Tanuja to tell us a little bit about this track before okay. it airs. Okay. So um, the, the music video that you are about to see is um, from a song called Heptanesia. And Heptanesia is the first known documented name for the islands that were Bombay. And it's from the ancient Greek for a cluster of seven islands. And for me, that word was just too good to be true. Like when I heard it um, during my you know, researching way, when I discovered it, um, I knew I had to use it. So it's the name of a chapter in Bombay Blues. It's a name of a song on the album Bombay Spleen. And it evoked for me ideas of amnesia and anesthesia and synesthesia. And just um, remembering and forgetting kind of an old India and a new India. And uh, the song is about that, I guess, sort of the space where those things meet and where they don't, and remembering and forgetting our histories, Excellent. our personal ones and, and um, kind of cultural ones as well. Excellent. So well, thanks for that introduction to the Thank song. You. And Directed well, by Tim Cunningham. Cool. I need to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and now we will view the video. Seven islands in an ancient sea, divine put all me. Tide is rising, throughout an arm can't reach our treasures, history. Lifeboat below me, the rippled sheet, a contour map. Of you and me, I shade my eyes and seek the other side. Heptanesia, Heptanesia. Young girl, the waves up swept five hundred years and all the land reclaimed. Now, hands still soil, they dare to change her name. Stars, foreign cars, 
Modern bar.